they do contribute a lot different today, but in those days we thought of girls as uh, strictly as wives, and, uh, and uh, we thought of them as somebody, in fact, some of the res religious sects around my hometown would only let their girls to go to school through the seventh grade because they reasoned that they were just going to be homemakers, and, uh, and so they felt like that was an adequate education. World War II changed all that. When the men had to go to fight the war, we had to call upon the ladies to run the war machine here in the United States. And so suddenly you found uh, women being trained as Rosie the Riveter, working in aircraft plants, working as machinists. And lo and behold, they found out that girls could do some things better than men, even in the, on the mechanical side, such as grinding, precision grinding, and such as that in the shops. So World War II, although it was uh, a calamity and uh, certainly of the greatest magnitude, and when I get into some of the numbers a little bit, you'll see what I mean, really was uh, almost an industrial revolution in some sense here in the United States for women. It was probably the biggest change in women since they first got an opportunity to vote. So it gets back, and I'll touch on an attitude in my closing statement, but it gets back to there's good and bad and everything. And you don't want to dwell on the bad all the time, although war is bad. But think of the good things that come out of any situation. Listening to the radio account, the hair would stand up on the back of my neck. And uh, it was very... Uh, the patriotic young boy in South Texas, it was very effective, uh, or it affected us quite a bit. Shortly after the war got going good, to give you an idea of how the patriotism was in those days, we lost the cruiser Houston in the Java Sea. They shortly thereafter, they asked for volunteers to replace the crew of the cruiser Houston. When they did, 1,000 men volunteered. They filled the street of Houston downtown. They swore those 1,000 in at one time. The Navy did. It was a very patriotic, spectacular sight. 1,000 volunteers downtown Main Street of Houston. This was a terrible war, though, and getting into the scope of it, there was actually 15 and a half million Americans under arms. Of those 15 and a half million, 320,000 were killed. Worldwide, there was 90 million men under arms. 17 million of those were killed, and an additionally 18 million civilians. So you can see, if you really get in war up to your neck like the Europeans did, and the people over in Asia, to where you're subjected to bombing attacks, War is anything but fun. 18 million. There was actually 1 million more civilians killed than there was military men under arms. That's terrible. I can't speak for the whole war. It circled the globe. But the war was basically broken down into two areas, the Pacific War and the European War. I was in the Pacific War. I was in the Marine Corps. I went in the 1st of 1943 and trained, and shortly thereafter, just a few months, I was in the Pacific. At that time, we did not have air superiority, and it wasn't any fun. Later on, I could appreciate the enemy's position when we had total air superiority, and they were subjected to bombardment around the clock. In the Pacific, it was maybe it was an army show in part of the Pacific and a Navy show in the other. Being a Marine, I was under the Navy commander, Admiral Nimitz. General MacArthur had uh, the army troops, and at the time, part of the naval uh, naval forces supported him, primarily naval air and battleships, uh, fleet type operations. But we in the Marine Corps, we were under Nimitz almost exclusively the whole time. Our, uh, our strategy was not to directly confront the major <coughs> Japanese
Japanese forces, but rather to try to bypass them and neutralize them. It was called island hopping. We, the chiefs of staff would look at the various islands and operations and see how many islands they could bypass and then they would take the island further ahead and then by cutting off the supplies to the other islands they were neutralized and we didn't have to go in and lose men taking those. I'll, uh, I guess what the boys would like to hear at this time in particular though is how we went about those things. And I'll get down to the unit strategy. I was in a rifle company. And a rifle company is your basic combat unit. In a rifle company, this is the basic weapon, an M1 Grand and a Springfield. In World War I, the Springfield rifle was a basic rifle. That is the basic rifle that the riflemen used at the, at the beginning of World War II. The M1 Grand had been developed, but it hadn't been issued and manufactured. There weren't enough on it had, that had been manufactured to issue to the troops. So actually at the beginning of the war, and I actually carried one of these for a short period of time myself. It holds five rounds. It's a good reliable weapon, but it doesn't shoot very fast. Shortly thereafter, everyone was issued the M1 Grand, which you hear about a lot today. It holds eight rounds and it's semi-automatic and it fires real fast. General Patton said that this was the greatest weapon to come out of World War II. <coughs> Some countries still use this weapon today. Of course, it's fast being replaced by automatic weapons, fully automatic weapons. On the old style weapon, this is a pack that I actually carried in World War II. And on the old style weapon, we used an extremely long bayonet. See, that makes a pretty formidable looking weapon. Later, when we came with the, the grand, we came with the shorter bayonet, which gives a <coughs> a little better profile. I'm not going to go on and, yep, I went on and gauge it anyway, but, go ahead. Is for like charging or something? I beg your pardon? For like charging people? Well, you hear a lot about bayonet charges, but I never saw one. Actually, we used that bayonet more. It was supposed to be if you ran out of ammunition or and were in close quarters. But actually, we used those more for opening ration cans than anything else, digging foxholes or whatever. I heard of one bayonet charge in the Pacific, but it wasn't, my unit didn't do it. Anyway, just the thought of it could scare people, but I never saw a man killed with a bayonet. That's your question. This is a basic military pack. One of you young fellows, the biggest one, come up here and put it on and turn around for the class. While we're at it, let's see if we can strap this thing around.
I was so thirsty I had ration a thimble, uh, uh, cap at a time off one of these canteen cups like, like this. I was so afraid I'd run out, I'd ration one little cap and drink it. <laughs> one time we were out of water for three days and uh, we were reduced to drinking water from the enemy's canteens when we could find it. And believe you me, you get thirsty enough, you don't care who drank out of that canteen, you just get some liquid in it. Another time I, going through the jungle, I was cutting every vine I could find, sucking on them to see if I could get some, some liquid. A lot of us uh, developed, uh, at times, developed some, some, some severe dysentery because we were cutting into coconuts all the time, and that's a very oily type nut, and, uh, and that forced to drink coconut milk for water. By the way, this canteen that you see on him right here, Here's one, and it's a World War II manufacturer. And we take, we took this canteen cup like this, and this is what we would heat our coffee in or cocoa or whatever. Sometime our food and cook it over the fire. So that's how that thing broke out. Then the other best gear that you were looking at. Sort of like your Boy Scout, but we did a lot of cooking in those, and this part slipped right over here, so we had a deal with something like that. But these are real handy even today. Our helmets were always also used. We used to use the helmet to pull the liner out and use the helmet to heat water, and we would shave and cook in those helmets. And, uh, well, how do you like your marine here? We haven't got, wait a minute, we haven't got you fully dressed yet. Sergeant Smart, raise your Fabulous. Okay. Let me take you off and put you down here. What is it? Oh, yeah, let's show you this shovel. This is an intrinsic tool. This is, if you left, if you got in an engagement, if you got in a hot engagement, you would normally drop these packs and depend on the rear echelon troops, transportation people, to bring your packs and gear up to you. There's a couple of things you always kept. You always kept your water, your cottage belts, your grenades, and your ammunition. And this thing right here, this is your entrenching tool. There was two kinds that came out. This was a later model. And you could open it all the way up and lock it, and it was a shovel. But you could bring it halfway and lock it, and it was a pick. So what we did with that, of course, is, and this is why it was invaluable to us, is we were forced constantly to be getting in holes to keep from getting blown away. Oh, so we'd dig those holes and, and get in there, and I can tell you that I hate work like the next guy, but you never saw anybody but gripe about digging those holes to get out, get out of the, the fire. Uh, in talking about combat, I might, yes, son. Uh, was it, I, I that one the earlier models right there. That well, there's another one that I have at the house, but uh, uh, the, actually, the earliest models, one was we used to have to carry two entrenching tools. We had a pick and we had a shovel. Then there was a model that came out. It probably came out about the same time as this. And it was, it had two parts on it like this. A pick on one side that laid down in the shovel. But this guy came out and you could use it as a pick or a shovel and it was lighter. So this is the reason this is the one that ended up being the most favorite because you, you always, when, when, you, when you carried your gear, you had to sacrifice something. And one thing we never sacrificed was ammunition. Most of us carried about five times more ammunition than we needed because we, had, we were quite worried, to say the least, most of the time. Yes, sir? Yes. Uh, Officers were issued 45s in most cases. Uh, I had a 45. I wasn't issued one. I managed to acquire one, and I carried it uh, the whole time I was in combat. 
My name is Young. Young. Jim Young. <laughs> yes, most of the time, though, all we put in there, we did have, in some, we did have access to what we call a jungle hammock, which you could hang between two trees, and it had a mosquito net on it. But they weren't, they weren't adaptable to frontline troops, rifle company people. So most of us never carried them because you couldn't it, you couldn't hang them. We were in areas where we had to dig in the ground, so we carried uh, actually what you call a shelter hat. So a shelter hat is something that you and a friend, it's like a big piece of canvas, can clip together and makes a little pup tent. And uh, so what we'd do is we'd dig in in pairs and put these shelter hats together and put them over us if it was raining. If it wasn't raining, we kept those shelter hats out of sight because we didn't want the enemy as they crawled around during the night to be able to spot us. And the best way to be spotted is to put a tent or something up. So you're very careful about putting things up that disturbs the terrain around you. Normally try to dig a hole and then you see pictures of people digging holes and piling up dirt in front of them. Well, you'll see that those will be positions that's more to the rear. Those of us that were right on the front lines at night we were afraid that people could spot those bounds and know there was a guy by, on the other side of it and lob a little grenade over there. So we, when we dug, dug our foxholes, we shoveled that dirt, unless we were behind the line someplace, we shoveled that dirt away from the front of that foxhole for two reasons. One, he wouldn't see the mound around the hole any place. And second, if he's crawling in the dark, he wouldn't free, feel fresh dirt. So we tried to keep that ground as natural as possible and maybe even lay a little uh, lay a little brush around there, not so that it wouldn't obstruct us. The problem with laying heavy brush around is, is people hallucinate in in the dark. I've seen the time when I've seen a tree limb and could swear it was a jap. Because the more I looked at that tree limb, the more it looked like a man with a weapon. And it was just literally, you know, and, and if you fired at night, you had a problem. Because if you didn't kill somebody, you had to answer to the officer next day because one of the major problems we had when we were dug in at night was the possibility of shooting our own people occasionally. We had a runner from San Antonio, Texas, Marvin Fuquay, uh, that was a friend of mine. And he was sent out by his commander with a message and they mistook him for the enemy and killed him. Fine young man. So it's really it's really, uh, we had to really be careful and have fire control at night. Uh, let me go on here and then we'll catch some questions later on. The operations that I participated in was the Bokenville operation in the Solomon Islands, and that was all jungles. And uh, any of you ask, want to ask uh, any question about fake jungle, though, I'll be able, I'll answer that. But it was in areas that was awful swampy, and in one particular case, we had a position that, of line that we had to hold, and it was through a swamp. And uh, my particular buddy and I had didn't have room. There was one. Well, they, we had there was banyan trees in that swamp, which are have huge roots, and this one root was out of the water, and the rest of the area was underwater. And there was only room for one of us on this route. So we took turns. One would stay in the water an hour, and then the other would stay in the water an hour while the other one got up on that route. The only problem with that is if you're afraid of snakes like I am and think about alligators and crocodiles, all night long I just knew one of them was going to get me, you know, when I was down in that water. So it can get scary. Our next uh, campaign for my unit was uh, Guam and the Marianas Islands. Guam was an American possession prior to World War II. It is today. We administer it. The people there were very friendly. They were Spanish uh, and, Amer and English speaking people, Chamorros. And uh, they really welcomed us there. And, uh, and it was quite an interesting campaign. I managed to uh, get wounded there twice once by hand grenade fire and once by machine gun fire. The Okinawa campaign was the last campaign that we, my unit participated in. It was the last major battle of the war. 
In that particular battle, my division, by this time I was out of a special unit and into a, a regular Marine division, and it, it, we had over 50% casualties. I don't mean 50% deaths, but 50% casualties. Altogether, there was 45,000 casualties taken that out. A Marine division consists of 15 to 20,000 counting the support troops, and we had uh, over 7,000 casualties in our division. Uh, we lost our commanding general. Uh, that was the first time I ever fought as an army. As you know, the Marine Corps is not an army, it's a corps. <coughs> in this operation, six complete divisions were used, uh, three uh, army divisions and three Marine divisions, and we were under the command of Lieutenant General Simon Buckner. He unfortunately got killed. They named a bay after him, Buckner Bay. And for the first time in history, a Marine ended up commanding an army because Lieutenant General Geiger was there and he assumed command of the 10th Army at that time. Uh, shortly after that, we returned to our base camp. Uh, the bomb was dropped in Japan, or the two bombs. And the Japanese unconditionally surrendered. After the surrender, which was, well, actually Germany surrendered first May the 8th, and then the Japanese on August 14th, and they signed the declaration above uh, on the battleship Missouri on September the 2nd, and on August the 30th, the island and the Japanese were simultaneously occupied by the 11th Army Airborne Unit, Airborne Division, and by our 6th Marine Division. So again, we had another first for our division. My regiment landed at Yokosuka Naval Air Base. Uh, at that time, I had already gone to come back to the, the United States, and so I could just receive some letters from some of my friends and hear about it. The occupation went smoothly. The Japanese people cooperated very well. And, uh, and actually, uh, from the way economically the world has turned out, I sometimes think that we won the battle and lost the war. The way the balance of payments go. I, I don't know if you young folks in the fifth grade understand balance of payments yet, but you know some more than we did when I was in the fifth grade. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. He, uh, to get into that in a little more detail, the first one was a hand grenade, and we were going forward, and we were closing in on some men and some brush. Well, I say brush is high grass. And uh, I heard some shouting, and there they go, and we were moving in a skirmish line. You know what that means? Another one of, one of us there were five yards, moving ahead with our weapons, flushing these, the enemy troops. And next thing I know, I saw these two grenades come like two footballs sailing toward me, you know, in the air. And I'll never well forget that. They seemed like they were just floating like butterflies. And I was diving for the ground, and it seemed like I was floating like a butterfly because I couldn't get to that ground fast enough. And that grenade went off, and uh, it uh, went off, I guess, three or four feet from me over to my left. And it was so powerful that it paralyzed me from, from the waist down, and it put about 150 little fragments in me, none serious. Some blood, but no seriousness. But I thought I was seriously injured because I was paralyzed for about 10 minutes. There was a boy standing, and grenades are funny. They, uh, they, they don't always blow equally in 360 degrees. They, they'll, chunks will go here and there, and I was the lucky one. There was a boy over, I guess, uh, uh, seven or eight yards from the grenade, didn't get any of the concussion, and he got one piece where I got 150, but that one piece he got was about that big around, and it went through his leg, and today he's got a stainless steel plate in his leg because you could almost see daylight through there. Go ahead. Um, what was your rank? Well, I, I was, at that time, I was a corporal. I was, I finally ended up a captain when I got out of the reserve, okay? Um, did they ever have any automatics in World War II? Sure, we had automatics. Uh, each fire team had a, an automatic rifle called a BAR, a branding automatic like rifle. Huh? Like machine gun. Oh, yes. We had, each company had a machine gun platoon that uh, had 
four machine guns, four light machine guns. Then in the weapons company that supported the battalion, we had some water-cooled 30s and some 50s. Um, you had, did you have three purple bars? Yeah, three purple bars. No, actually I only got one. I should have got two. I was actually hit three times, but I never turned in for one of them. And uh, the other one they gave me, and I, I didn't actually turn in for that either, but I ended up getting it, and I ended up, uh, but I wished I'd have turned in for the other one, I didn't. How did the machine get one Well, we were on a patrol, and uh, we had come down a cliff, and it was a 1,300-foot cliff, and I'll never forget it because I was more afraid of that cliff climb than I was uh, the enemy. The Japanese had built, a, had built a ladder up the side of this cliff, and they had done it with uh, tree limbs. And, of course, they're much lighter than we are. And I was a big guy, and I was carrying a BAR at that time, and a lot of ammunition and grenades, and I was very heavy. And every time I'd step on one of those branches, it'd start creaking, you know? And, and all I could see was treetops down there. And I, I just about died going down that thing, a hundred deaths and coming back. At, and, and they also helped us out a lot. In, in several places, they knocked out about four or five foot of runs. And in those areas, when we went back up, going down was all right. You just slid down it like a fireman slides down a pole. But going back up, we had to climb hand over hand. It started raining, and that, that wood was slippery. And at one point, I thought I was going to drop off of there. And about that time, I looked down, and I saw those trees like that down there, and I got a surge of energy. <laughs> and I, I pulled on up. There was a little rest platform there, and I pulled over. I managed to get my upper body over that rest platform. And I hung there until I got enough strength back to climb on that platform, rested some more. Getting close to the top of the, of the plateau at that point, I thought, surely, <clears throat> the lieutenant would be mad that I was holding him up. I was in the last group coming back up that cliff. And, uh, and I was worried, so I managed to get on up to the top, worried that I was going to get fussed at about holding up the patrol. And I got up there. The whole patrol was laid out like they were dead. <laughs> And one, one, one enemy could have come up there with a club, I think, and killed all of us. That's how tired and fatigued we were going up the side of that, that cliff. I, that's the scariest thing I ever did in my life. That's worse than facing the weapons. Was the Japs or the Germans the hardest part for you? Well, I never did fight against the Germans, so I can't answer that question. I'd say that... Uh, the Japanese, because of their code of honor, were probably would probably a be, be more tenacious enemy in some respects because they didn't believe in surrender. And uh, even sometime when we would approach them after we had wounded them, we had to be very careful because they would explode grenades next to themselves and try to kill us too when we'd go up there. And uh, they're tough. They were very tough and uh, very formidable enemies. Well, the Japanese lot quicker than y'all getting around places and everything. Did they get y'all quicker than y'all got to do No, not really. No, not really. Uh, I, uh, I often wondered when I see the films in Vietnam and different places and all the boys loaded down with those black jackets and all that other equipment, it's sort of like you think about tank warfare. What's the most important, armor or mobility? We were fairly mobile compared to the, the armies that fought in Korea and Vietnam. Uh, we would shed this stuff and just be with this equipment right here only in our ammo and Based on that, we were just as tough and just as fast as any Japanese. It was just that they, they, we placed a higher premium on life than they did because they felt like that it was uh, honorable to be to die in battle, and frankly, we thought it was a lot more honorable to stay alive. <laughs> yes. Well, I'd rather not go into that because then it sounds like that you're glorifying war. And the thing that you want to remember is, is that war always sounds glorious until you get in it. But it's 
always easier to start a fight than it is to get out of one. Believe me. It's just in a, in a battle, it's the same way. You, you, you engage troops in a battle, and then you try to pull back. They won't let you go. It's like getting a tiger by the tail. Somebody's going to get clawed up. Any other questions before I conclude? Did you say the word I was overseas two years. <clears throat> I was. I went in in 1943 when I was seven. Just as soon as I turned 17 years old, and I got out after the war was over. Did you ever, um, regret the Never did. I was proud of it. I did regret that I didn't finish my high school first. I got my high school diploma after the war. I got my, some college after the war. But I always felt like I'd have been a lot further ahead in life if I would have accomplished my education first. That hat right on top of there, is it shaped for any reason, any special reason? Well, actually, actually that hat's just a field, a field hat that Marines wear. They call them Smokey the Bear or whatever, have you? We didn't actually wear that, that cap. A few guys did, but most of, of us never carried those in combat. We had the bell type, fatigue type, type hats or helmets that we used. Yes? Well, that's a good question. I didn't explain that a while ago, but we didn't have penicillin in those days. We did have sulfur drugs. And in this little case right here, we had a case of dolls and, and sulfur drugs. And each platoon had a corpsman. And this corpsman was, was like a medical enlisted man that traveled with each platoon. And he gave shots and morphine and things of this nature. Blood, uh, well, we didn't have blood, but we had plasma and somebody got wounded. And uh, they had suffer, suffer drugs and, and morphine. One time, I had an ulcer that wouldn't heal for about uh, six months. One time I got terribly sick on one of those islands, and I, I never felt any worse. And, uh, and the corpsman gave me some morphine to get me through the night. And, uh, I guess that's the only time in my life of them being in the hospital that I ever had a drug or anything like that. We had no drugs, by the way. I didn't know anybody in the Marine Corps that ever used drugs other than I will admit some of them use a little alcohol to take but I'd like to give you three parting shots, and that is that in conclusion, and that is that as young people thinking ahead, that above all things you want to put God first in your lives and your character. If you don't have that, you're in trouble. You want to have a good attitude, and you want to remember that it's all right to be disappointed. Everybody gets disappointed. But never let yourself be discouraged. In the areas that I was in combat, I've seen some times when I was frightened near to death, where I was miserable and all. But even a drowning man has got one good thing going for him. He's not dead yet. And somebody might just yank him out of the water. And all you do when you get to let yourself get discouraged in life, all you do is hurt yourself. So don't blame your troubles on somebody else in this life. Shoulder your own responsibilities and try to find a bright spot in everything. And last but not least, and that's one of the musts, is you never have a second chance to make a first impression. You never have a second chance to live your youth over again and get an education at the time in life which that would be the most meaningful to you. So you've got to take advantage of these precious years and concentrate on getting an education and remember that just because you're macho and just because you might have a high IQ and might be smarter than someone else, unless you are also educated, you'll never reach your full potential.